he uh, has published articles and also one book. The book is entitled Winston-Salem Southbound Railroad. He is president of the Winston-Salem chapter of the <coughs> Railroad Historical Society. He got an early start in history of railroads. His dad took him to see a train when he was three years old. And since then, he's taken 12,000 train photographs in all of the states. So, uh, after he finished the uh, service in the U.S. Air Force, he followed his father in the practice of optometry. Uh, he has a practice in Winston Salem, and he do you still practice in Walnut Cove? No. No? He did practice in Walnut Cove. Uh, very pleased to have you here, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It has been an educational experience learning a little bit about Walker Town. And uh, one of the things I found out about is that there is no city map of Walker Town. I have looked everywhere. And I tried to find some old city maps, and I'll show you why. I wanted to get some details, but I never did find them. They went everywhere, but they just don't exist. So what we want to look at tonight is um, the railroading in Washington. Well, there's not a lot. We know that. But there's enough here to be of interest to us from a historical standpoint of just what all went on here, why it went on here, and probably the impact on the community. We have to turn the clock back to a time when the only way you got anywhere was the horse and wagon. Now, I don't I understand this Walker County got started somewhere around 1770, something like that. Maybe you guys are correct in that. It's Dr. Walker started out uh, with this community. And this is how you got to Winston site. We all know of Auburn Station down here. The purpose of Auburn Station was a place to stop and spend the night if you were headed that way. You're on the road here, go to north, we go on up through Madison, Maydan, uh, come to Martinsville, and on into Roanoke. And from there, you kind of hit the Shenandoah Valley, and you can go to Pittsburgh, or to Hagerstown, or a lot of other places. But, this is how you did it. Can you imagine putting all that together in a rainy day like today to go into Winston Salem, which is often was a two-day trip because it was just roads or slammed. There were no roads. And can you picture doing that? Can you, can you, can, it's really hard for us to understand what the railroad meant. So that's how you do it. That's how you got the groceries. Maybe you went once a month, depending on what you could afford to do. Well, we transitioned from that to the kind of stud wagons that we can see here and into the uh, NS main deal. How did we get there? How did we get to promoting power like that? Uh, and have, how did, how did we make that journey? This is what Winston Salem first looked like, wherever it was. And I got to put a lot of concentration. We'll be on Winston Salem because it was the rail center close by. And kind of have to look at that as well. So, this is downtown Winston. Uh, and as you can see, a couple of buildings up in the top up there, uh, they, uh, they're they still there. The one the mansion roof up there, they were the back warehouse. And this was downtown Winston. The station was on the left. And we'll take a closer look at those. But that's kind of what it looked like around the turn of the century. You know, I mean the 1900s. When the railroad started out, this is an early map of North Carolina, around the Civil War time, actually before the Civil War. And you can see on the map there, does anybody have a pointer? A laser pointer? I forgot mine. I realized it after I went to talk. Okay. Anyway. But up here at the top, you can see it says Danville up there, and, uh, right there at the top, right underneath Ward County. And that became known as the Piedmont Airlines. So you see the first Piedmont Airlines was not really an airplane, it was really a railroad. Mm -hmm. And it came down to the Green <coughs> Meanwhile, the North Carolina Railroad came across from Raleigh, actually from Goldsboro, but it 
came across to Raleigh and through uh, Greensboro and into Salisbury. And they crossed in Greensboro, and that's where Greensboro got the name Gate City, because they were the gateway to all these places. I put a little green dot up there beside the site. That's where Walker Town was, and there was nothing up there. I like this map because it shows you where some industries were. As I said, it's all pretty so warm. And, uh, you know, so we had gold in a couple of places. We even had some coal mines down there. Egypt over there, North Carolina actually had some coal mining going on. So, this is the way it was before the war. And here are our towns in the area. And the Piedmont Airline, as you see, comes down from the right side to Greensboro. And it became known as it became the Richmond and Danville, is what it actually started on in modern after the war, after the Civil War. Uh, it became that. And it went on from Greensboro to part of the North Carolina Railroad and uh, ended up from Greensboro to Salisbury and on the Charlotte. You owned at one time part of the North Carolina Railroad. As a North Carolina citizen, everybody owned a piece of it. And I'm not real sure what the current status is as far as the state. I think we still own a piece, but you own so little you can't buy a cup of coffee with it or anything else. <laughs> They built the line from Greensboro to what was Winston Sutton. And that became known as the Northwest, Northwestern, North Carolina Railroad. Now, the important thing was when it came into Winston Sutton, uh, they were headed to Salem. And people in Salem, they didn't want to railroad there. Because they felt like, look, the type of people it's going to bring in. They're not going to be the good, good Moravians. So they didn't want any drummers, really door-to-door -door salesmen at the time, and they didn't want these people there. The Kernersville Depot is, the Kernersville Freight Station is still standing, and it is the oldest uh, depot of any sort of oldest, oldest railroad structure in the area. So, uh, They later built from Greensboro to Rural Hall, and that became, was the Cape Fear and Yadkin Valley, which ran out of table and went to Rural Hall. And from Rural Hall, it ended up going on a little bit further to Mount Airy, and it arrived there in 1888. Once again, we still don't have anything around here. And it did go through Walton Cove. In the 1881 time frame, that we kind of talked about a little bit, there was a man in Winston Salem known as Henry Fritz, a good Moravian, and he had the idea of we need a way to go north. And he proposed building a railroad that would be known as the Railroad in Southern. And that was the first railroad through Walkertown. Uh, And it was started in 1891. The railroads went on from Winston Salem down to, also in 1891, was the North Carolina Midland Railroad. Now this is the railroad that you see if you go out Stratford Road past the mall. That is really the North Carolina Midland Railroad. It was then leased to the Southern Railroad, and then it went on into North and Southern. But technically, legally on the books, it's the North Carolina Midland Railroad. And Freed was really quite something. He, he, started, he started Wachovia Bank. He began the cotton mills that are in Madison in May of that. that was his main thing. Textiles was the big thing in the area, not tobacco. Textiles was everything. Furniture played a part, but it was still textiles that were the money was. Okay? So here's a better timeline of what went on. 1887, they met and decided we need this railroad. And it was Colonel Freeze, that was Henry Freeze. He got the honorable name of Colonel. He was a respected citizen at the time of the eight to late 1800s. You got known as Colonel, especially in the South. And it had nothing to do with military service. 
J.W. Haynes, we know who those people were, they found Haynes Hunter and R.J. Reynolds. It was built in two divisions. They built a section from once to the Martinsville, and that came through here, and to Martinsville, Roanoke. And in 1891, the section from here to Martinsville was complete. In April and by December, it was complete from Roanoke to Winston. The railroad still was the Roanoke and Southern, but it was leased to the Norfolk and Western. And in 1896, it became known as the Winston Southern Division of the Norfolk and Western Railroad. It still is. And here is the engine that ran through here for the first time. This locomotive came through Walkertown for the first time. This was the first engine to come through. And you rode on a coach. And this coach is a Road Oaks and Southern coach. So if you wanted to take the train, you may have got on this coach or one just like it. There are only two. So. Mm -hmm. And then here is the depot in early years. And as you notice, it had a lot of steps. You have a signal out there to the left. Uh, and this was the depot. Later on, it became modernized, so to speak, and looked more like this in the 1950s, probably the 20s and 30s. But anyway, this is what it really looked like. And you notice there was some four type signal. Those went away in probably around the 50s. Hard to say when they actually went away. And that may actually just be a train order a little bit. Nonetheless, that type signal has gone away quite a in the 50s, let's believe it that. So, you notice that out there, kind of back up here for just a second, you go back there and look, you notice there's a track down on the side of the signal. And there's actually another track behind the depot. And this was called a team track. The reason was that most stuff came to the depot, would come on the train, would come off the train, and if you wanted to take it home, you got your team wagon, and you went and got it. And they're still called a team track today. That's where the name came from. It was a team of horses who come and you unload. In this particular photo, we see a gondola full of coal. And what happened was a guy would load up his wagon with coal. He would come to your house and deliver coal. And that's how you got coal to heat your house. You got to think about it. How did people eat heat here? What did they do? Some of you may remember a coal furnace. You may remember having that. And it may have been even stoked, may have been automatic. But a lot of them you shoveled it in. So, how did coal get there? It got there like this. Remember, we're all pre automobile here. There are no cars. Here's the timetable from 1897. If you look at this timetable, you can see there were four trains that came to Walkertown. And if you look down toward the bottom of the schedule there, you will actually see Walkertown. And you can take the train into Winston Salem, to downtown Winston. If we look at that first train, number 75, it took 30 minutes to go to Winston. 30 minutes compared to almost two days. Think about that a minute. Think about it. You can't get to downtown Winston 30 minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so there were four trains a day that you could go to Winston. You could also go up to Rono, and in Rono, you could you you had an option to get in a lot of different. You could go a lot of different places. You could go pretty well anywhere in the country from Rono. You could go to Cincinnati. Uh, the J we've all seen 611 J. Everybody talks about. It. That came through Rono and went to Cincinnati. So, and you can go to Chicago, pretty much anywhere you wanted to up there. So it connected the, Wal the Walkertown community to the rest of the world, 1897. And this was the kind of cars that the NW was used. The road and southern was gone by this time. And this type of car was what was used to go to Winston or to go to, go to, go to Toronto. And here is another picture of the station, and once again, we see a car parked over there on the team track. And it was probably, who knows what was in it or being put in it, but they would have used that team of wagons to put stuff in or out. You may have come there and actually shipped packages. If you want to send something somewhere, you can do that. It would be put on the train, not necessarily in the boxcar. And here's another photograph, I think, so maybe you can put it on. And Today, this is what's there. Mm -hmm. I 
tried to figure out more about this, but could not. I don't know when all this got stripped down to what you see. I just don't know. Some of you may know. But they stripped all the, the uh, stairs off. I'm sure 311 got widened out up there some of the, the road. And this is what's there now, uh, is the yellow building. I assume the railroad still owns that. I tried to do some Yes, sir. I worked for the guy that rented this uh, old depot. Yeah. In 1960, he got a 99 year lease from the railroad to have that building as a warehouse. He stored the fabric in it. He's on the fabric center down here. Okay. And I don't know what the status is, the fabric center is gone. So I'm sure the railroad still on I would think so. The track's out there. Yeah. And what I don't know, and we'll look at here, and this is what I tried to find out with some mapping and sandworm maps, and we'll come back to it in a minute. In 1910, uh, this is the way things looked. You saw that the Norfolk and Western was there, running, and the Southern was out there. And this gives you an idea of what things looked like right around the turn of the century. And later, in 1910, we got the Winston South Southbound Railroad. And it pretty well completed the rail picture of this part of the state. Uh, it went to Wadesboro. It was built because Freeze, once again, was the man behind all of this. He wanted a way to take coal from Roanoke down to Wadesboro, where it was interchanged with the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, and went to Charleston. At this time, the U.S. had a coal-burning navy. And the idea was to take stuff there so that we had a way to provide coal for the Navy. And it was a straight shot. And if you look on a map, you see it went from Waitsburg to Florence, Florence right down to Charleston. And uh, that railroad is still operating. A few of you operate this, uh, work for the South Foundry is still there. It's still very active. It's a great road. This is the first train to operate on the South Bay. And I thought that was an interesting photograph. I got this picture. This is an original. Uh, and how many more of these exist, I do not know. But this one was, was uh, the first train uh, on the South Bay. It was not lettered unless it's on the South Bay because the Norfolk and Western was providing equipment. By 1950, this is what we saw. We have the addition of the High Point Council of Bend, which came in the 20s, and it went from High Rock to High Point, and it's its own set of stories. But that's pretty much what was here up until 1982. In 82, the NW and the Southern merged, and we'll get back to that moment. This is a big engine. I'm people talking about what engines came through here. Well, there's an off of a class. This is in Winston. The Coley Tower was there. The building to the left is still there. Um, and anything you see in this picture came through Walkertown. Here is a picture, an uh, aerial picture of downtown Winston. And this is the Norfolk and Western Yards. And the engine you see under steam under there, it was headed to Walkertown. It was headed this way. Uh, this is prior to the building of Interstate, uh, uh, excuse me, building of I-40, as well as the building of US-52. And they actually crossed uh, down there, uh, kind of there in the smoke. Uh, oh, I wish I could do this better. Uh, they actually crossed right up there, is where, the, is where 52 and I-40 actually cross each other. So you get an idea of where that is. Notice the big curve. Remember I said they didn't want to go to Salem. Salem didn't want to go to Salem. Salem didn't want to go to Salem. Salem was the money. Salem was everything. Once it was nothing. And Salem said, no, if you drew a straight line up there at the top, top straight ahead, you come right through Salem Square. So that went away. Went that. This is the, the little bit that remained of the first station. Not much. Uh, it was pretty well torn down. And this part did remain. It's gone now. And there you get a little bit better view. This was the first real station in Winston. Uh, there may have been a wooden building of some sort, but 
that's kind of up in the air, or whether or not that wooden, wooden part that, you, that I've seen in the picture is actually part of this. Well, from there, they needed a modern station. So around about 1905, and actually about, oh, maybe about 1911, they built this station. This was downtown Winston. It was a kind of, kind of Spanish-looking architecture. If you look at it, and it was down at the corner of Third and Patterson. It's long gone. And uh, this is the station that you both buy: the Norfolk and Western, the Southern, and the Winston Southern South. So all three railroads use that station. There's another picture of it. Uh, and it was right, like I said, that it's Third and Patterson. There is nothing in that little parking lot now. It's a little kind of triangle shaped piece of ground if you go down there. Cranky's, I think they used to park like a Cranky's coffee was down there or something down there. But it's gone. Uh, those of us who imagine we see streetcar wires in there, who knows? And you can tell by looking at the cars. Look, look at how it is in that picture. One of the main things going on here in Winston was a streetcar, which you can see a little bit better in that picture. And there are the tracks. And you can imagine there was only one or two tracks there for all those trains that were going through there. There were a lot of trains. It really was. If you shipped a package from here to Winston Salem, it came into the Norfolk and Western freight station. This is downtown also. Uh, this is about 4th Street. Kester Machinery is on your left in this picture. Uh, and that building was their freight offices. And believe me, they had plenty of bills. And this is where they ran the railroad out of. And uh, so if you got a package that came from Winston through Walkertown, and you could do that, it would come from this building and go up, get put on a train and come up here. Of course, packages went all over the world here, too. And they also had the area that you see on the, on the right side, kind of going back. That area on the, uh, you know, on the right side, it was where stuff came off the train and would be put on trucks to, to be distributed throughout the city. This was well known for its streetcar system, and they had streetcars that were the third city in the country to have streetcars in Winston Salem. A lot of people don't really realize how important we were at the time. Winston Salem at one time was a major, major research and industrial facility. It really was. And this is downtown. And another shop taken down to Courthouse Square. It even has the infamous statue in the picture there on the right. So, but uh, you can see the streetcar coming up Liberty Street here. And they lasted until the 1932, and they were gone by 32. This is an old site. The streetcars were designed and built by the Pearly Thomas Company. Pearly Thomas was in High Point. And he's the one who developed, designed, and built the streetcars for the Orleans. If you go down to New Orleans and ride the streetcars down there, you're on Pearly Thomas car a little night. That's kind of a map of the streetcar system before it went out 32. Just kind of give you an idea that it kind of did a big crossing the town and this sort of thing. Well, the station down there at Third and Patterson is not adequate, and they wanted a bigger station. And there were plans drawn, of which I have the originals. I'm not trying to brag, it's so good. Uh, of a station that was going to be built and be the talk of the country. It was going to be a two level station with streetcars on the top level and real trains on the bottom. And it was going to be fantastic. And when, you get, when you see what they had planned, World War I came about, depression came about, <coughs> not the 1897 Civil Depression. Anyway, and it was jointly owned by the three railroads and was operated, and this gives you an idea of what trains were there. The Green Arrows marked the trains that came through Walkertown. And you can see, by this time, we had six trains coming through. This passenger train, we're not talking about freight trains, we're talking about passenger trains. So when you look at that, you say, hey, look at all the passenger trains that came here. And you get an idea that there were a lot of trains through there. 
It really was a very, very busy place. This is an aerial view of the station. And you notice the circle in front, the intent was that's where the streetcar was going to turn around. That actually never happened. The plan, the streetcar started going out, buses started coming in, and as a result of that, they actually never did put the streetcar tracks in. That was the original plan that was to do that. Uh, this is on, originally that street was known as Wheeler Street. It later got changed to Claremont Avenue, and now it's known as Martin Luther King Boulevard. This building is being restored. We're going to look at some of that. There's the building from the front. And this was the white side. And segregation, of course, was big in the south, we all know. This is the white green waiting room. And this is exactly how it looked. Come down there in about a year, and this is how it's going to look again. I'm on the group working on it. Um, and this is what the plan is. And we have a wonderful architect. She is just terrific. And uh, she's a historian, and we're going to do this. You see the marble floor in there. I see the dredge floor. We're getting the rock from the same quarry to put that back. So it just, I can't tell you, I'm just very excited about this because to do this sort of historical restoration is just unbelievable. Near the station, there was this cobblestone street. And those of you may remember, there was a tunnel that went underneath the street. Over there, as you can see in the corner. And uh, over here, it went underneath the railroad and came out at the station. Some of you may have done that. You know, I remember doing this stuff as a kid to go to the station. So the train you see came through Walker Town. The station had a, was controlled by a railroad tower, and uh, that was down there. The track in the foreground here, the same track, is what sell southbound, and it crossed over southern right there. And uh, some people say that's exactly where the beginning of the track there, on the same southbound. So. And this is the station. The only picture, and I put this picture, this train is coming to Walker Town. It's going to come through here about 30 minutes after it left. And this is going to run up. There's a K-class locomotive on the front of that. The two platforms were there because that's what they had to have. But they were busy. And here you can see a train leading. And there's the tower over here on the left side. Some four type signals one way. And here's a Norfolk Washington train headed to Walker Town and beyond. Another train. We get kids around it. This K-class locomotive. And um, the train headed this way. This is an unusual train. These people got off the train, and I've yet to really have a firm identification of what this was. We know it was prior to 1957. Don't know when. And some of you may look at that be able to say something about it. I don't know. The train came from Walker Town. It came down that, came down the line from here. So it did do that. Some people say it's a Boy Scout expedition. And I've, I've heard all kind of, notice how people are dressed to come off the train. Notice the clothes. Notice how our society looks. It's how much more formal we look. Another coach that uh, was down at it also came down the line from uh, from Roanoke. Two trains headed up, headed up to uh, Roanoke, coming through Walker Town. They have never seen any of the same like this. Right. Mm -hmm. But these are from there. Now I put in this overhead shot because that's up for me. Uh, walk up here a second. Station. Now, this was my connection to what went on. You notice there is a coach right here, and that was actually a sleeper. And as a child, I can remember you could get on that sleeping car at 5 o'clock, and along around midnight, it got pulled out, and you could go to New York. Winston Salem had its own 
car to New York. That's the only people on it. Think how important that was. Think how important we were. And here you can see this, this station down there. We went to New York and uh, it came back around 5, 6 in the morning and you could stay on it until 9 o'clock. And then they would resurface that car and have it. The one thing I think about was there had to be porters, there had to be uh, individual sleeping car attendants, the laundry had to get done, all of that was done here. And the question is, probably those porters were black. So they gave black people a job with the railroad. It was a very respectable job, very nice job. I've never come across anybody ever said they would. This went away probably in the late 50s. Early, I actually want to say more like the middle 60s. And somewhere in that time frame, I think probably the last time I wrote it was probably in 58 to 60, somewhere in that time frame. We didn't drive up to New York. Where were we going? There are no interstates. How would you go? How long would it take? My grandparents were in New York, so that's how we used to do We did that. We had a car, and it was great. I didn't sleep a week. <laughs> so, and here we see a, another passenger train, the southern train. This did not come through here. It was going to Asheville. This was the Asheville Special. It ran from Greensboro to Asheville. You notice the platforms are gone on one side there. The reason the platforms are gone is this is after US 52 got built. When they built 52, they took the platforms out. Another Asheville Special train. My dad shot this April 23rd, 1957. This was the last standard steam operated railroad train to ever come into Winston so Not an excursion, it was the actual freight train. It was the last one. Winston Salem southbound, and on the, once again, you can see the tower there. But that's it. My, that's, my dad took that one. This is out on Stratford Road. Right there where the Biltmore Dairy used to be. Remember Biltmore Dairy? This is where my dad took me to watch trains. And he, we'd go in there and get some ice cream. We'd sit out there and wait for the train to come. The train went down a couple more blocks and stopped at Staley's Restaurant. And that's where they got breakfast put on the train for everybody. We had ordered breakfast. They picked up the phone. They called Staley's when the train left for Asheville. And said, hey, uh, put these on. And people ordered breakfast. And that's what they did. And my dad used to take me. And dad had a photography bug a little bit, and he was kind of a lot of fun. He didn't want his son, who was about this time probably seven or eight years old. You don't need to see those old dirty steam engines. The new world is coming. I want you to see the passengers, the, the great diesels. Look how pretty these are. This is where the world's going. Boy, we've only gone out and see steam engines. But anyway, this is toward the end of service, pasture service through Walkertown. It's North Open Western Pasture Train coming up, coming up, uh, coming up uh, 311 New Walkertown Road there. Mm -hmm. And uh, headed, of course, through here. For the southbound people, the 767 was actually WSS 1501 and got repainted in the W. They'll understand that. And here is the last timetable that had Walkertown and this timetable was printed in October of 1960. And there is the timetable. And there you can see Walk Town on there. At this, by this time, there was only one train each way. And this was it. When this went away, there were no other passenger trains that ever stopped. This is the last pasture train in Winston-Salem. This is July of 1970. And this is, you can see how ratty things have gotten. Look, look at the weeds, just look how terrible things are. The railroads did not want pasture service. They viewed it as a losing proposition. And the more miserable they can make the passenger, the less likely the passenger <laughs> is to buy a ticket. Therefore, they had justification to discontinue. And I actually have the, I don't have a picture of it here, but I have the discontinuation notice where they 
the application was that they applied to take it off and then uh, they got rid of it. Today, this is what we have. This is the railroads in the area. This is all that's left. Uh, you can see the line that went through Walnut Cove from Greensboro is gone. Uh, and we have the Norfolk Southern. Norfolk Southern came about in 1982, merging between the Norfolk and Western and the Southern. And this is the current stats. What you see there is what exists. I left the, new, the North Carolina Railroad on there for a reason. It's still there. It's still the line that goes between Greensboro and Charlotte. Uh, it's where the, if you take the train, it says go by train, you go to Raleigh. That's the North Carolina Railroad that's running there. And uh, we have some friends of ours, Don, so you know what I'm talking about. He's supervisor. But they, there's still a lot of connections to it. And as taxpayers, we have a share of that. So, uh, this is the depot in 03. And here we are in October of 15. As most of you know, it became Davis Garage. And Davis did a very good job of maintaining the place. The building was offered to me by a gentleman named John Eaton, who was with the Winston Salem South. And he said, Jeff, if you want it, I'll sell it to you for a dollar. Get it off the books. <laughs> and a couple of us went in there and looked at it, and the asbestos problem was horrendous. And we knew that we did not have the money to pay the tax to do anything. We just didn't have the money. Today is another story, but in those days, we did not have the money. That was in 79. And we had to let go. Uh, Davis Garage guy, Mr. Davis did a very good job, I think, of using it for his business and maintaining the interior of the building. So I cannot fault him. This is the colored side. The other side here that I'll show you is the white side. This is the colored side back from the days of segregation. And this was the colored vendors. And they came in with the colored waiting room. This is close by. This is right down here. If I should recognize this, I drove right past her on the way here today. And it's right down in the water 311. And uh, 66 kind of makes a turn going to eat the track. You see the signals there, those aren't original. We originally had a different type of signal. I should have put a slide in that, I just didn't. Uh, and the reason for it is the Walker Town car lot. Now we all have heard of the Walker Town car lot. It's right down the road down here on the Walker Town. Road. It is one of the largest car, automobile, unloaded facilities in the country. <clears throat> when you drive past there, you will see a huge number of cars. They come in these enclosed car carriers. There was a time when they came in open car carriers. The problem was when they came here, partway between the thick around Martinsville, you're not sure. Cars became less of a car when it got here. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like that was a surplus transmission place up there. <laughs> and whatever else they could get off on the way down, because the, the grade of hers is so sharp, so steep, right, that they go real slow and they can throw stuff off. And these guys would jump on the train, work on it, and run over to South of Martin, and get off what they could and throw them off. And they never could, they can't some, some you could, some you couldn't. Anyway, they come in close car carriers like this. And if you ride by there, you'll see things like Union Pacific on Canadian National. <coughs> you'll see uh, to Brunton Moore, you'll see a bunch of When you see West Coast Railroad, such as you people, what I said, uh, you know that they're common cars, probably from Seattle or Portland. Damn you. If you drive a car that you got imported, that came in through a West Coast port and got to your deep to a dealer here, it came through Walker Town first. That's where it was. And here we can see a train that's doing the switching and they would put the car down. You see all the cars lined up there. I'm sure many of you have seen that. And you see the train down in there. There's an aerial view. Some of you may have seen this, I don't know. Just to give you an idea of how big this place is. Everybody worked down there. You do? I work down there as a weekend supervisor. So tell us about it. Um, all I can remember, to be honest with you, was I would call them when they say a train was coming down, you find out how many cars were on it. For every three cars, you had one person come in to unload. So we usually had about seven or eight guys come in to unload. And mm -hmm. the, the cars had all the keys in one car, it was all coded up. 
as soon as we got through, we were done for the day. But uh, that was just a, a summer job that I got when I was about, I think I was about 20 at the time. But uh, that was a long time ago. I thought you said this yesterday. No, I wish you No, no. <laughs> but you can see down there at the end level, uh, it is quite an operation, and it certainly puts the name Walker Town in the mass. People have noticed the Walker Town car a lot. And you cannot find another car lot that's been, I looked around and I couldn't find any Google problems trying to do that. But still, that's huge. Look how much space they got in there. At one time, that was the only car lot in the southeast. And then they've added more since then, of course. But, uh, yeah, it was the largest, I think it was the largest one ever built. It may have been. It could have been. It certainly could have been. And uh, the other thing was cars came up here from Atlanta. There was a Chevrolet assembly plant in Atlanta. And so, right there by the NS. Why I come into Atlanta. So you may find some other, but the main thing is think about on the West Coast. Think about it. The car made over there came to Walkertown. Made in China, made in Japan, made in Korea. It's Walkertown, everybody gets to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's not there. So, yeah. And we're back to our depot again. And the team track there. And this is looking the other direction, so I won't have a view going both ways. And there's not much there. What I don't know is uh, what was here. I don't know if there was anything there. And this is when I started my quest to find a map of Walker Town. It'll be an old map that might have something on it. I have not found that either. So I don't know. Some of you may be able to tell me. And this is the other end. The other thing. I have a feeling that this team track went somewhere. This track here. When, as you can see, it's kind of going off through the southern of the picture there. It had to go to something that was too long to just be able to offload it in the And I don't know where it was. Some of you may know, but sometimes you find out. Let me know. I just like to come and know. Anyway, so who knows where it went, but I, just, I have a feeling there was something else there. Uh, and it's looking back up the line again toward Romo. And this was a great shot. People wonder what came to what comes through here now. Well, Steam excursions come through. These excursions were ones that the NRHS chapter ran. And I ran a lot of them. Um, and this was the last one that we had to have a picture of. It was engine 630 coming. All of the steam excursions went from the came through here. The Norfolk and Western J, the Norfolk and Western Class A's, they came past Walker. So now we need to know we're here. This is where we are. Where are we going? This is the inside of the Winston Settlement Station. And as it was prior to restoration getting going. It's now being restored. And more stuff was just crammed in there. And you get an idea what it looked like. As I said, Dave did a good job. He did not repaint. See where it says tickets? That was put up there in the 20s. That's gold leaf from the 20s. The car den, the men's room, the women's room, 20s. All of this is being restored. This is in the uh, white rain room, the color waiting room that's back behind the, uh, the center portion. <coughs> there was really very little difference in the two. Uh, primarily, the floor type, the chandelier was a little bit nicer. The shoe shines stand is still there. It's going to be restored. It's going to look like it did when it opened in 1926. The car that you see kind of behind the wall there, that's how you went to the trains. That went down to the trains. This is that car again looking down the car. And you actually, there were stairs from here that went down to the platforms, and that's how you got on the train. This is the magazine rack. This is the tobacco shop. It's going to be restored to look like it did in the morning set, where they sold cigarettes, cigars, any kind of tobacco products were sold right there. It has a spiral staircase inside the building that people didn't really know about. And here we see some more restoration views. Look out the window. 
train still doesn't buy there. And we still hope to see some more pasture trains or something else come out of there. We're going to hope to make this into a historic spot where you'll be able to read about train history and be able to watch trains. And the National Royal Historical Society is going to be very active uh, in restoring this area for a place that people like trains, but they congregate uh, and do things. Uh, not sure how it's going to turn out, but some things are still in a state of flux. This gives you an idea of what it looks architect's drawing. There's the inside, those are the those are chandeliers. They've got pictures and they're rebuilding the chandeliers to look just like they did. More research has gone into this than what people imagine when they took paint samples off the walls. They got hold of the Smithsonian. They got hold of the historic Williamsburg. To analyze these paint samples to say what kind of paint was on this wall originally. What color was it? Who made it? And that's been done. And you can see we're going to put benches back there again. And they'll be, we fortunately have one bench left, and we're going to be able to use it as the model for the rest of it. We have no idea where we're going. And the future holds this. This is what may come through here again someday. Um, this is the Carol Post of 74, which is the only one that runs. And if we can get everything together, you might someday see a passenger train come back through and stop in Watertown. We don't know. The good side of this is Roanoke has just opened a brand new passenger station. And from that station, you can go on Washington and where we're going to go. But you can get on the train in Roanoke now. I'm not sure this getting large, but you can do that and come back to Roanoke. It's only 100 miles up the road. So we're hoping we can get something to come through here. Don't know. It may come. It may not. If, if it comes here, I have to do that. Maybe we'll loop through the through Grace World with less than no one seems to know. I think a lot of what's going to determine what happens is the general economy, general feeling in the country, where we want to go. We had an argument that you couldn't have a passenger train, you had a passenger station, so that was a while. And then we had the passenger station, we had trains the way we wanted on the main station. Well, things have changed in Winston, and now we do have a passenger station, and it will be really quite the place to see. I, I, that's all I can tell you is going to look just like it did. And, uh, we're going to, the way it's going to work is the top floor will be restored exactly what was there. The second floor is going to be community rooms and other purposes of the city. The bottom floor of the depot, which was the old baggage area and places where, where your baggage came in and some other things were done, um, is going to be used for the traffic control system of the city. The new traffic light system is going in there. It's where the meter mains are going to work out and some various things like that. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see how it all turns out down there. We're going to schedule time to get it reopened will be the end of this year is to get the building where people can start using it. Don't know. I'm there on and off quite a bit. We'll see. Um, and so we have a great architect working on uh, Michelle Waters, and she's just terrific. She, she's, if you want something to store in Town, get over to her. She'll restore it for you. Make it look just like it did. And uh, so she's there. Um, and we'll have to see what goes on. It's in the hands, right now, it's in the hands of the construction crew. They are busy down there uh, putting in. Uh, utilities and kind of doing the things that need to be done to make a good Yes, sir. Where to find it? Yeah, how's the fund? Where's the funding coming from? Three guesses, folks. <laughs> Grants? Try again. <laughs> Taxes. Really? It's, it's a tax project. The city's had the building um, and it's going to come out of general. general. There's, there was a bond issue floating to see what that got done. It did not include anything for trains. And we'll just have to see how all this comes out. I hope we get trains back. Um, there's a lot of proposals. One would be to have a train at the road from St. Clemens, down Stratford Road into Greensboro. The possibility you could go to the airport. Who knows where that's going to be? The interesting thing to know right now is that the railroad. Owns all the way to the center line of Stratford Road, 
And if they want it back, it's theirs. They own it. We just let people use it. Say, hey, you want what's right now? You can put it on our property. But we can take it back. So it's out there. Um, and we just don't know where it's all going to end up. I think it's going to depend a lot on the general economy and feeling about mass transit as this situation and all. But at least we feel the argument is you don't have to trash it. Now we go back to, to, to various places and say, folks, Raleigh, legislature, we got a train station. We need a train. We can go up to the federal government and say, hey, transportation board, we need a train. We got a, we got a brand new station. Now we need a train. So who knows where that's going to end up at? No, nobody wants it. It would take a lot of track improvements, a lot of things. And people say, well, why can't you just go down the southbound? And then connect back up to the southern. Well, that's got its own set of issues there, trying to get a faster train down the southbound. Uh, we just don't know. You know. I'm not saying it's impossible, but there's an issue down on the track that, that have been actually there since the, since the team. There were some problems by trying to do stuff like that. So we don't know. We just don't know. Well, we got to take one step at a time. And I think the people who are doing a great job, with great architects, a great, uh, a great construction companies down there. And uh, so, so it's really hard to say. Anything else anybody wants to ask, please do. The only bad question is the one you're afraid to ask. Yes, what, is, what does Spencer do? Uh, Spencer Railroad, if they take care of all the maintenance and everything, the depot up there? Oh, it's, it's Spencer? It's Spencer? Yeah. Okay, Spencer does not have a depot. You're talking about the Spencer facility now. Yeah, facility. So, yeah, the the whole transportation museum is part of the state, the Department of uh, Historical Archives in the state of North Carolina. And that's who that, that falls under that. That gets a, a grant from the state legislature, plus entrance fees, a lot of other things. So it, it's, but everything that's been through is that way. The Salisbury Depot is maintained by Amtrak. Um, Any other questions? Yes, sir. How, back in the 1880s, around that time, how were the locomotives uh, rated? How were they rated? Rated? Yeah, in, in terms of power. They were rated in horsepower. Um, I really can't give you a number of answer on that. But that's how they did it in horsepower. Mm -hmm. They did it in uh, attractive horse, attractive effort. That was another big thing. Attractive effort is probably the main thing. And that kind of translates mathematically to do that to horsepower. Uh, not a lot. I mean, you, you just really didn't. You had those 440s, four and they were not, they were called Americans, and they weren't very powerful. But they were what we had. And that's what we used. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. How universal were the tracks? Were the, mm -hmm. the tracks, how, how universal were they in terms of their, their purpose? Were they multi-purpose? Were they various Yeah, colors? all tracks are the same in the U.S. The same with four feet, eight and a half inches throughout North America. Um, and that, that's the standard. The South used to have a five-foot track until after the Civil War, and the two were not interchangeable. And because the South did not have, they had some four foot eight, they had some five foot, there was that's a track down in the South here that was two foot. And that's determined how much weight you can fall in. I mean, kind of like a super highway and, and a plain old country road. Uh, uh, but it's all four foot, eight and a half inches today, except for some historic three foot ditch. Tweetsie was three foot ditch, for example. It was cheaper to build at the time. Anything else? Uh, yes, sir. I just want to make mention of your uh, railroad flood. Yeah, there's a Marlboro Club out on Stratford Road. I mean, I'm excuse me, Country Club. The Southbound Marlboro Club is out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, one, the picture of your depot uh, looking toward the west, I think, on the uh, The track there, you wonder where it went to. And that is. Uh, kind of across uh, Main Street from the new fire department. Somewhere close there was the Walkertown Chair Factory from about 1910 until it burned down the second time in the early 40s. And so I think the track could have gone out to it. Uh, the other thing was the depot. Uh, uh, this is sponsored by the Walkertown Area Historical Society. And I know a couple of our members have talked with the people in Roanoke about the depot. And I, I think it's probably still the situation. If you would like to have the depot building, you want to uh, start to give it to you, 
but you have to move it, which means you have to have a place to move it to. So if you're looking for a depot building, contact the government office. One thing I do that I hope the historical site had, there used to be signs in that building that said Watertown. Yeah. And I don't know whatever happened to it, but I know they're on the building. And I looked for some pictures of it, just couldn't find any, but I know they're on there well into the 70s, maybe even past then, and, and maybe in the 80s, and there was a sign there, you know, a sign like you know, a green sign, like the, and it said Watertown was on both ends of the building. It was, Hoping that somebody in here got it and was part of the story. So, yes, sir. The best of my recollection, that side track you're talking about is running through there. I think it's running that close to where Paris Market was, and they dumped the coal out there, and they took coal up and used it for that. Certainly makes sense. And so another you, question, Tim? Yeah, anybody, I looked at the story that people at one time. Bob Davis was interested in it too. And at that time, the heirs, heirs, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even talk to me. I tried to call them and they wouldn't talk to me. But that depot would make such a good entrance to Walkertown from that end from coming south to one of the coast. And it used to be one of the first things you saw when you came around the curve and you had that sign you were talking about. And in those days, I think the building was painted white. But as any, with all that in background, having nothing to do with anything, has anybody ever talked to the railroad about getting that piece of property deeded to Walker Tail? You don't need the whole thing. They will not turn loose of that property. I don't think you can get it. But I do know that the woman who has the lease was leasing it for $300 a year. I was leasing the building, but the railroad is still on the property with the land. Well, you and Doc Davis ought to find a spot to move it to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it sits there much longer, there's not going to be anything yeah. in the problem. I, I, yeah. well, well, if you all want to see what can be done at the depot, the a great job has been done in uh, Rural Hall mm -hmm. with the only planning and gacking depot over there. Donna Abernathy owns that, and she's always welcoming in people to come up here. That is a beautiful restoration project. She has a community room in there, and she's got more historic artifacts in there than no one do with it. But, uh, but they did move it. Any others? Mike? Yes. Yeah. That Yankee Valley line, you see those these uh, the engines over there, where are they maintained? Who owns all that? That is owned by a corporation known as the Gulf and Ohio Railroad Corporation. They got, they are, they lead, they rent, lease, they, they have different working ranges, railroads all over the country. They own the Yadkin Valley. The Yadkin Valley was originally part of Norfolk Southern, and may still, the track rights may still be, uh, and they have what they call the thoroughway track. Well, they lease these things out. Right. The engines are maintained primarily out in Donahue. I think that's where they're doing the wrong okay. so, But there's really not much there. They do everything in Rural Hall, and they do some down in Donahue. The other thing is, we need some major overhaul. They've got some overhaul shops. I can't really remember where the closest one is. And they would haul stuff to one of their big maintenance facilities and do it there. Well, there must be enough business for them to... They're very run. busy, because they haul all that corn. All the corn that gets feed that goes out to uh, uh, North Wilkesboro for all the chicken farms out there. Oh, yeah. That's their primary thing. Wow. They now are hauling ethanol. There's a new ethanol and loading facility out there. They're hauling uh, uh, and they do haul some plywood. The main thing is the grain. The grain is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And they haul grain out there. There used to be a depot at Guthrie, which would be going from Winston Salem to Greensboro. Yes. And it was an open air, but I've never seen one like that restored. In other words, it was just a platform with a roof. Yes, those and were called Flagstop Stations. And the Flagstop Station, I, tried, I didn't want to get this program to long, but I had one of those. They were what the railroads built, nothing more than a shelter to keep the rain off. Mm -hmm. And they, you 
flag the tree down up there like this, and we would flag the train down. The guy would see you out on the platform flagging it down and stop the train and let you get on. Or if you're on the train, you told the conductor you wanted to get off at this place and to stop, and they would stop it. They were not a regular stop. They were not manned. They were not anything. Do you know of one that's been restored anywhere like that? Uh, flag stop station, you gotta think of that. Uh, not off the top of my head, but I know there are some. But I can barely remember what it was. Yeah, but that's what, yeah, that's what they look like. They have one, we think that the Thaver Station Road, everybody's heard of that down in Weston, maybe the Thaver Station Road, we think that's what was there. I know one that was at Haynes, I've got the picture of it. Uh, and Haynes was right with Mullins. And there was a flag stop station there and an open shelter like that and all it really had was a roof and a place for and a bench where people could sit out in the night was about in. That was it. Yes, sir. Uh, steam excursions. Why did they stop in this area? Was it a matter of cost or a matter of interest? Uh, I can't really, I can't give you a definite answer, but I would say that management of the railroad changed and their philosophy changed and there was a lot of different reasons why the excursions stopped and we're talking about stopping the first time which was 84 which was when they just boom over the hammer and said no one was uh, I think there was some internal politics I knew for a fact they were making money off of it they were they were they were netting about two million a year off the excursions all the time. So I don't know exactly why the Claters, who were great people, uh, Graham Clayton, well, he had a couple people in the uh, Graham Clayton, who became head of Amtrak, he was head of Southern, he was really responsible for getting that whole excursion business going in the 1960s. He uh, was a great train lover, a great man, and just a personal friend, just a great guy. And he, he did that. His brother became head of the NW, Robert Clayton. So between the two of them, they, they loved trains. And when they left, because of retirement, whatever had, the whole thing kind of fell apart. And Clayton, Grant Clayton went on and became head of Amtrak. If you go into the Washington Union Station, it's named in honor of Grant Clayton. I'm just thinking you probably sell a ticket to about everybody in this room. I have no doubt. We, we <laughs> sold out every train, and I was uh, chairman for running the trains. We sold every train except for 10 seats over 15 years. Wow. To give you an idea. And they would sell out. We'd have waiting lists of hundreds of people wanting to go. And I would, I would call up the Joe Bison. I was getting that time here in the business for the university. Jim, he'd say, Jeff, you got to tell me you want another car. <laughs> and I'd have to say, yeah. He was vice president of Southern Railway at the time. And he said, I'll see what I can do. And finally, I'd come and he said, I don't want to hear from you anymore. <laughs> I don't want a car. Don't call me. But uh, I got along very well with those people. Our club, Jerry Maney and his wife, Shirley, who were sitting there, they helped a great deal. They cleaned cars. They, they did a lot when they were, you know, I've never worked so hard in my life as when we did that excursion where we had multiple stops, yeah. different prices as well. I mean, the people work very, very long. And uh, I wasn't the only one, dude. I just had to be one of the more than the chiefs had. A lot of other people worked very, very hard. And, uh, and it just went away. It wasn't anybody's, it wasn't anybody in the community's fault. It was strictly a, I can't use the language. <laughs> but, anyway, uh, but it was strictly, I'm boss, well, we want to do this. Well, I'm boss to say you can't. Well, why can't I? And there got to be some real problems up there. You know, there are personalities, and I think if different people had been there, it probably would have turned out that that's the way it is. Um, any other questions about, yes, sir? Tell us about when Eisenhower came through. Was that about 52? Yeah, Eisenhower came through on September 26, 19. 52. He was campaigning for Crosby. And I remember seeing him at that time. He stopped at, he came in on the Southern. He stopped at Moore School. And that's where I was in elementary school. He came out on the back platform, waved everybody. 
And you got to realize that to my grandparents, you know, he walked above the war. You got to realize where this man was. He is the one who saved the world. In every, in a lot, in, this, that's all you can say about the man, and, and he did. And uh, he stopped there. He, they brought the train into Winston. They came down and went and put two J-type locomotives, 484Js. I don't remember what they were doing. And they went from Winston, Rome. Obviously, they came through here. And yeah, that's what still, they did. And, that was still, still. and the reason I know the date was, it was my dad's birthday. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm told by some of our older members that walked down that school out so they could go down towards the foot by the sea. Yep. Yeah. He came through. Yeah. I remember he stopped yeah. right there. We held hands. I was one of these, something 52, I was probably nine years old. And we took, we held hands from walked down school up to the depot. And Eisenhower came through, standing on the back of the train, he waved to us, and we turned around and walked back. That's what Wayne Bond is on. <laughs> well, these guys are old. He's old. He's old tonight. I used to work. He's old. I used to work for the Southern and, and the older guys. I, I worked there during the 70s and early 80s. And the older guys told me when the Richmond and Danville came through from Greensboro to Winston in 1873, it was originally a narrow gauge railroad. That's true. Most people don't know that. Then they had to change the gauge. I don't know how long it lasted that way. They sold bonds to build that line. Did you know that? And the people never got them. Railroads were at that time frame probably up till maybe World War One. They were the dot coms. They were really the dot people. So they'd go out here and they'd come into Baltimore, they'd build a new railroad here, and they'd go out here and get a horse or two, they'd clear some land, and they'd lay down about three times, and they'd say, Don't you want to be a part of the coming railroad? And everybody get their money, and next thing you know, that was the last year it's all the railroad. <laughs> that, was, that was really uh, done a lot. That was really kind of the, the Civil War up to about the World War One. That's when all that kind of took place. And it really was. Nobody wanted to be left out of the financial growth here. You know, that's what it was. But it wasn't there against the start. I don't have any pictures. Or, I don't have enough information on that. There's, there's just some interesting things about narrow gauge. Some of you may have written down the US 29. There's a road that says narrow gauge road. Nobody seems to know why it's called narrow gauge road. And we can't see them on the railroad there. And I've asked everybody I know. Nobody can ever give a definitive answer on them. This was it. A uh, question about the depot again here. Uh, is it in limbo? I mean, when the lease runs out, what, what's going to happen to it? And, it, and it, is it now just a vacant building? Is it just, just four yeah. walls and roof? Yeah. There's a lot of trash in it. Uh, Harrison told us that the air's got a 100-year lease, so it's still in effect. Fabrics is not in the bag of that. What? Fabrics is not in the bag of that. Yeah, but I think, um, what's uh, the daughter in law's name? Uh, she still is paying the leak. She well, is still paying the leak on that bill. So if the, if the building deteriorates, and it will eventually, so, I mean, that's all it is. What I can tell you from the, the story from the NS, the building deteriorates and they decide by whatever method that it's going away, it goes away very, very quickly. And probably less than a week it would be, you never knew it was there. They, I've seen them tear down stuff and they tear it down like there is no more. So if you want it, you need to do something about it. A lot easier to tear it down than restore it. Yes. Quite cheap. And they don't want it because it's a lot of You know, they don't want some kid going in there and stepping on a nail. Yeah. Or I've no been in on the wood. You'll see a piece of wood fall right out of the rafters. So the only way it's going to get saved is if somebody actually moves it. Yes. Yeah. I don't, you, the railroad doesn't want it on their property because if something happens, they're going to get saved. Yeah. Even if they're not, it's on your property, we're going to see it. They know they have the deep, we say they have the deep pockets, and that's where they're going. And I think any of our guys are going to tell you that. That's, we used to run train trucks, so Jerry can tell you, we used to have to get $15 million worth of liability on the train. Run with those excursions. You have no idea what's that cost. And then 
getting an idea that what the government said. You've got to have people clean up. You can't. We will not let you up and put people on the list. Well, I could put an eight and a half inches. I didn't know how that came to be, but I have forgotten. Do you remember? Uh, it's the same distance as Roman chariots. Well, that's what I remember. <coughs> Roman chariots, when they go to Rome, they look at some of these old things like the Appian Way and all the places, and they see the ruts in there. That was the will. Now, there's another story that goes with that, ladies. They said that. If the reason they built them that wide, of course, in those days, they used horses and ass, that you would put them aside and look at them with the two asses. That's kind of where they came from. So, uh, and they said that's where that diameter, that width came from, really from chariot and chariots. Who knows what it really is? Don't they? Got to remember there was three foot gauge. Um, that was pretty much squeezy. They were three foot wide. There was also. Um, Another popular gauge was 30 inch gauge, 42 inch gauge, used a lot in the Philippines and in the, uh, in the areas of, uh, of the South Pacific, it was 42 inch gauge. Russia uses 5 foot gauge. And you kind of get in a situation of what you gain by the wider it is, the bigger you can be, the more weight you can carry. The narrower it is, the less weight you can carry, the less, you know, and the less it costs to build. Most of the stuff out west, you go out to Denver, you go down to the American, like the Rainbow and so on. You know, you know, it's historical. They're all three foot gauge, right? Because it was cheaper to build for the mountains with three foot gauge. Tweetsie was three foot gauge for the same reason. It was cheap to build to haul the iron around. So they did three foot gauge all the way to Lillington, uh, and there they switched down to Stanford to finish. And there's a lot of bait, you know, in the railroads are being built with one gauge one bait. There are some really weird gauge signs out there in the country around the world. Because that's what somebody said, let's make it this wide. Okay, let's do that. And the uh, weight of the rail out here, it has a weight in, and it may be what we call 100 pound rail. And that means it weighs 100 pounds per yard. And it's, it's based on that. Yes. Have you seen the uh, depot down at Hamlet, North Carolina? Yes. It's gorgeous. Uh, we built, I built, was in charge of building the layout in the basement of that layout. And the best way to build is there's only a few in the United States that can get to that airport. Yes. But we built that. Our railroad was there. Built a warehouse and one of the And we then. Cut the wall out of the side of the warehouse in order to get the layout out of it. We loaded that on a truck, we got it there, and we had to roll it down into the base of that building by using a crane and dropping it down in that building. That was a lot of problem. Yeah. Yes? Somehow, ironically, we got a, uh, a letter here from NC State University uh, looking for people that are interested in restoring the depot. And uh, we, we're going to discuss it at our next board meeting, which will be on uh, April 10th, up here to, at the uh, Law Center. But uh, kind of shocked, out of nowhere, they just sent this to us. And there's a lot of money grants and stuff being given away right now. Well, nothing's given away, but uh, <laughs> that, that they're asking people to take off projects like this. So we're going to discuss it at our, our board meeting. And uh, see if there's any way we can nab on to some of that. I agree with you. It's a it's a treasure. You know, once it's gone, it's gone. But we we our associates do not have the money to take on something that heavy. Well, maybe the town can do it. Huh? Maybe the town can do it. Well, <laughs> town tries to push it on us. Well, that yeah. We don't know where we money. Mike, tell them that it's an open board meeting in case there's. Yes, the, the board meeting on the 10th is open. Everybody's invited to show up and, and discuss this. So we do it at, at 6.30 in the evening up here at uh, the White House. We'll uh, kick this around and see if we can't uh, find more money somewhere. Well, if you buy it for a dollar, you just need to land put it yeah. Then you can work on it. Can we put it in your backyard? No, we'll fit. <laughs>
We've got, a, we've got a survey we've got to fill out and send in to NC State. So we're going to go ahead and do that and then see what they have to say. There's so, a lot of people that offer money and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're just one of me, you know, jumping into the pile. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it is a nice project. Well, tell, the town, project. tell the town they got property right across the river up here. They just built that building over there and a little shelter. So they got property right there. And she lives across the railroad. Put it right in the middle of that playground. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> be a playground for us older people. <laughs> Anything else?